Hey, Evan, it's Dr. J here in the house. How are you doing today? Hey, man, good morning. We're, we're up bright and early today for this. Yeah, we're trying to get our podcast in earlier just to free up time in our schedules to get other things done. So I think it's great. We're going to be trying to be uh, chatting weekly at 8 a.m. CST, 9 a.m. Eastern time. So I'm really excited to be here with you. It was a phenomenal weekend. The weather this time of year is just absolutely amazing. How's it where you're at? Oh, man, it's been magical, too. It rained for like 48 hours straight, and then all of a sudden the clouds break up and the sun comes out and the birds are singing and the grass is green and it's growing so fast now. So I can't complain. That's great, man. Excellent. Well, today we talked about in our pre-show, we were texting yesterday over the weekend about doing a podcast on anxiety, and I think we can we can just dive right in. So off the bat, when it comes to anxiety, let's just kind of touch upon your personal issue with the mold. So we've talked about mold and environmental stressors potentially creating histamine responses and then creating mood issues. Why don't we go into your experience with the mold, with the mycotoxins and your anxiety? Yeah, I had for the last six months to a year, I've had random little spurts where I was having heart palpitations and some of that was related to my cavitations. I did that podcast with Dr. Stuart Nunnally, my surgeon yes. who cut me open and cleaned yep. out all my eight cavitations. But that was a huge source of heart palpitations. But after the heart palpitations disappeared, I still had some anxiety. I'd have these random blood pressure spikes and I'd hit you up. I'd say, dude, what's going on? My blood pressure. I don't know. And now I figured it out. It's related to mycotoxins because what mold does when you're exposed, if you're living in a moldy house or a apartment or a condo, or you work in a moldy office, or you're a librarian and you're working around moldy books, mycotoxins prevent nitric oxide production from working properly. And you need nitric oxide to help with your vasodilation. And so you basically have a constriction of everything, which is why my hands and feet have been so cold too. It's because nitric oxide is getting blocked by mycotoxins. And so when I take my detox supplements, whether it's binders or supplements like chlorella, I notice my hands and my feet will warm up and then all of a sudden I'll feel better. I'll get more energy. And my anxiety just disappears. So I can't say that this is the only trigger. We do want to talk about blood sugar and some of the diet pieces too, but I'll tell you just yes. personal experience. I've had all the adrenal stuff dialed in. I've had all the blood sugar stuff dialed in and I still had anxiety issues and it was all tied into mycotoxins. But it was better than if you didn't have the had that stuff dialed in. Oh yeah. If I, I mean, yeah. if I, if I was not taking daily adrenal supplements and if I were skipping meals or not eating enough fat, I would probably be a wreck. Yeah. And if we kind of look at your history, like these problems, like you have, may have had problems in the past, right? Before you kind of got into this field, you had that dialed in, you were better. And then along came the mold mycotoxin stress years later. And then that kind of brought things back to a head again. Is that true? It is. Yeah. Cause when I was living in Austin and I was packing yeah. up, moving back to Kentucky, I remember calling you. I'm like, dude, I'm having an anxiety attack. I can't control it. That was all adrenals. I mean, yeah. I, was, I was literally working with clients on top of a cardboard box with my laptop, ready to pack up and drive 2000 miles across country. So that was more situational anxiety. I remember that too. There was a lot of blood sugar issues too. I think you were going like eight hours without eating. And I think we made a couple of t blood sugar tweaks and that helped a lot. Yeah, I was probably going like maybe five hours, which was just too much for me. Now I can't do that anymore. And but so I think also too, I remember at the end of your day, I think there was just a big gap between when you had dinner and when you went to bed. I think you were like eating at 5 p.m., going to bed like at 10 and then like not having your breakfast until like 10 a.m. the next day. Yeah, it was a long time. Yeah, it was like it was five like hours. A, it was like a 15, 16 hour gap, which, you know, that's kind of like an intermittent fasting kind of gap. But for some people that could be a little bit of a blood sugar stressor because when we go and utilize gluconeogenesis, that's cortisol dependent. People forget that gluconeogenesis, which is fine, it's normal, but it's cortisol dependent. And if we don't quite have enough cortisol or our adrenals are a little bit taxed, we may not be able to enter into those processes um, optimally. So that's something to keep in mind. And I did not have enough cortisol. I did my salivary adrenal. Yes, I remember that. It was low. It, it was very low. It wasn't like completely burned out. I wouldn't call it adrenal fatigue, but I was at the bottom end of the barrel there without being under the low end of the reference range. My cortisol sum was maybe like a 12. Anything below a 10 is terrible. And I was like a 12. So I was barely hanging in there with adrenals. Exactly. So 
kind of key things to think about. I want people listening to, to think about the underlying mechanism. What's the mechanism of why you're feeling the way you're feeling? This is important because a lot of times when you're going to the conventional doctor, really the underlying mechanism is not addressed. Typically, there's the genetic predisposition, genetics, like victimization type of mindset where like we don't know what it is. It, here it is. Here's this drug. So people don't really connect the dots to the cause right? So we're trying to trace everything upstream to the cause. So if we look at the toxicity mechanism, there's this potential inflammation from the toxicity, which then may create histamine. And that histamine can easily create issues with vasodilation by blocking uh, nitric oxide. Is that correct? Yeah. So the, I want to so make I sure I say it right. too. I, I get it confused. There's laughing gas, which I think is nitrous oxide nitrous oxide and then nitric oxide is no no right and that's yeah, believe, basically believe dilated that compound yeah nitrous i believe the nitrous oxide i believe that's totally different i'm just going to type in nitrous oxide versus nitric yeah one's like one, one's like the laughing gas anesthetic and then the other one i think it's no yeah, NO, NO, and then I think it's in. Is it in two O? Let's see. Nitric oxide is NO. It's not the same as nitrous oxide in two O. Nitric yeah. oxide is one molecule of nitrogen, one molecule of nit uh, oxygen. Nitrous has two molecules of nitrogen and one of oxygen. That extra molecule changes the gas completely. Yeah, exactly. So NO, we're talking about not the laughing gas when you go see your dentist, and you make a lot of this. And now one other thing that decreases nitric oxide NO is going to be fructose. A lot of fructose, a lot of carbohydrate. This is one of the major mechanisms behind high blood pressure and extra fructose and extra sugar, primarily in the form of fructose, right? But that's going to decrease endothelial synthase or endothelial um, synthase, which helps open up it's the enzyme that helps with nitric oxide stimulation. Nitric oxide opens up blood vessels. So imagine we got these garden hoses on the side of our neck called our carotids. And if these essential garden hoses, if constricted, decreases blood flow to the frontal cortex, which then decreases nutrition, decreases oxygenation, decreases the ability for us to calm down inflammation. And that can manifest itself in depression. And today's podcast topic is going to be anxiety. So very easily there. Yeah, you could have anxiety just from drinking soda and eating Pop-Tarts. I went over to my mother-in-law's and yep. she still has Pop-Tarts in her pantry. I'm like, oh, God. what the heck is a Pop-Tart? So I look at the, you know, I ate that as a kid. So I yep. look at the ingredient list and there's like three different types of corn syrup in there. It's like corn oh, my syrup. God. It's like corn syrup solids, which is guess what? That's fructose. You've got high fructose corn syrup, so there's right. more fructose. Right. And then you've got like uh, another another corn syrup added in there somewhere. somewhere. On, and then on top of that is you've got enriched wheat and uh, there was some like BHT and a bunch of other preservatives in there. I mean, so people will say, oh, well, I'm, I'm not drinking soda. But if you're eating Pop-Tarts, that's just as bad. You're still getting high fructose corn syrup. I mean, high fructose corn syrup is in every processed thing ever. You go to the restaurant, you go get a grass-fed burger, and you get sweet potato fries. But then you do the standard ketchup on the table. That ketchup is high fructose corn syrup. So then you're in the same boat again. I know. And then we're not even talking about, you know, the high fructose corn syrup primarily comes from corn. So if it's not organic, you're getting glyphosate, which is Roundup residue. And then also there's some data that a lot of the processing of high fructose corn syrup conventionally involves uh, mercury preservatives. Then there's potential mercury exposure that you're getting too. So you have mercury in Roundup and then um, then you have the inflammation by the de by decreasing the um, the nitric oxide, which vasodilates. So we have a couple of different mechanisms that are really throwing us downhill. Yeah, people are saying, okay, well, why are you on a tangent about ketchup and high fructose corn syrup? How does this relate to anxiety? Well, because it's creating inflammation and the inflammation makes your blood pressure go up. And when your blood pressure goes up, you feel anxious. You can feel flushed. You can feel yes. like your throat's closing. You can feel chest tightness. You can get tremors yes. or palpitations. Like when your blood pressure's up, trust me, I've had it from personal experience. It does not feel good to have high blood pressure. Even if it's exactly. just temporary. Exactly. Now, uh, you mentioned the the life stress too, like the cortisol piece. So cortisol is a big yep. issue with anxiety. You and I have tested thousands of people at this point. We've seen high cortisol and low cortisol both can cause anxiety. So that's why it's important to test, not guess, because you may look at someone's case history and it may sound like, oh my God, this person's yeah. got to have high cortisol. 
but then you test it and they're just flatlined. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So um, very, very important. So if we look at the diet and lifestyle stressors, that's a big component. Of course, emotional stress is going to be a big one. What's happening with emotional stress? Typically, we're having surges of cortisol and adrenaline, right? And of course, what's adrenaline going to do? Adrenaline does cause vasoconstriction. It tends to shunt blood flow to the arms and legs to run, fight, and flee. So it's primarily going here for prehistoric survival mechanism. And it tends to be going away from the brain because you need parasympathetic function to have good blood flow to the, to the internal organs in the brain. So you're going to have less to the brain. And that's part of the reason why when you're stressed and you have over sympathetic, over cortisol, over adrenaline, you tend to have less blood flow to the brain. And that's why people make um, a lot of poor decisions when they're stressed. There was, I was reading a study at one point where they talked about uh, a lot of violent criminals in jail, that a lot of violent criminal episodes had been made in a hypoglycemic state by the criminal. So essentially oh. that, that your frontal cortex has about, I think it's like 25 or 20 milliseconds to shut down an impulse. So like you see someone like that walks by that like really bugs you, you, you kind of think, I want to get them. Well, then your frontal cortex goes, nope, not, not a good idea. So when you have that decreased frontal cortex activation, which could be decreased from cortisol and blood sugar and stress, that you're going to have that inability to not, to not um, dampen down that impulse. Well, think about, I mean, I just saw a video a couple of weeks ago of a prisoner who was like sitting in like a courtroom and he goes up and he just like smacks the lady in the head. One of the ladies who's like standing, like testifying, he goes up and smacks her in the head. And then he immediately just sits down. Like he realizes, oh my God, what did I just do? I Think know. about the, the prisoner diet. I mean, their diet is terrible. Oh yeah. I mean, if we were really were interested in a society um, rehabilitating prisoners, uh, you'd start with nutrition. I mean, if I were to go in there, number one, I'd have all I'd, I'd have all criminals working on a farm producing all their own food, so society didn't have to pay for it. Number one, and then number two, get the nutrition up. It's impossible to rehabilitate someone with very poor uh, brain function from amino acids or good healthy fats. They've done studies before. It was in the Food Connection book. And they talked about adding omega threes into prisons and it helping to decrease the violence rate in the in the prisons like significantly. So omega three fatty acids are very important for anxiety and mood and behavior function because number one, your brain's primarily fat; it's seventy percent saturated fat and cholesterol. But omega three fatty acids are very anti-inflammatory. So if we have inflammation going on in the brain, we have surges of cortisol right? We have blood sugar fluctuations. We have our microglial cells in the brain are activated. These are our immune cells in the brain. They're going to be activated when inflammation is going on, whether it's from foods or stress and good omega-3 fatty acids, anti-inflammatory fats like omega-3s from DHEA and EPA. These are 20 and 22 carbon chain fatty acids are very anti-inflammatory. A lot of people are against fish or they just simply don't do enough high quality fish. So like in, we use triglyceride form fish oil. We yep. work with professional healthcare companies. So yep. that's a product that you may want to have in your toolbox if you don't already. Don't just go to Costco and buy their fish oil and assume it's going to be good enough. It's not. They're using ethyl ester form, which is where they attach an alcohol molecule to the fish oil. Your liver has to process that. If your product smells fishy, if you have fish burps, throw it away. It's rancid. Buy Justin's product or buy my product because yep. we want to get you on a high quality fish oil for your brain. Exactly. And if you're consuming fish, three to four servings of fish a week is great. Even if you're pregnant, just really just focus on high selenium to mercury ratio fish. So your wild Alaskan sockeye, your cod, your haddock, your skipjack tuna, these are going to have a higher amount of selenium to mercury and that will help essentially, um, bind up any mercury that may be there. And if you're on the fence and you're doing sushi, you can always do things like some activated charcoal, things like that, just to be on the safe side. Oh, by the way, I bought a TV for the first time in 10 years. Oh, wow. And uh, it was because I wanted to watch the new documentary called Our Planet. Oh, yeah. On Netflix with David Attenborough. And uh, I was looking at some, I mean, our ocean is basically screwed, but uh, hopefully we can turn it around. But he was showing some of the bluefin tuna, which are like, almost all the fisheries are being overfished and the whole ocean's collapsing because we're overfishing. But they were talking about some of these tuna that could be 1,000 pounds. It's like no it's wonder like, they're so toxic with mercury. They're 1,000 pounds. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. I 100% agree. But um, yeah, it's really important stuff. I'm glad you finally got a TV, man. I mean, I don't watch TV outside of a couple of Netflix shows. I mean, right now, I mean, I watched Game of Thrones last night. That was, man, that is my show right now. Love it. I've never checked it out, but I'll have oh. to. But people should watch that Our Planet because it is, just, you should watch it too. It's amazing. I mean, yeah. it really it, it really says, hey, look, like we've got a lot of issues. There's still some beautiful stuff left on planet Earth, but We've really got to turn things around. And I think with our podcast, we're helping to turn things around from an ecological perspective because we're encouraging people to get local meats and pastured meats. And we're trying to turn away from the conventionally factory farm animals, which are creating a lot of damage to the water table and to the soil and, you know, buying local beef. Because if you go to the grocery store now, you're going to see grass fed beef from Brazil and they're cutting down the rainforest in the Amazon to grow uh, soybean and also to raise cattle for grass fed beef. And so you want to make sure you're not buying Brazilian grass fed beef and you can get it locally. It's so easy. And then also with your palm oil. So like if you do snacks like plantains, like I do, I love plantain chips or plantain strips, make sure your palm oil is a certified palm oil. So it's sustainable and you're not cutting down the orangutan, their forest in Indonesia. They're critically endangered now because of us cutting down their uh, you'll see it too in the in the documentary where they just clear cut native rainforest and they replace it with just a monoculture of palm uh, palm trees that, that for the palm oil. And so, you know, even look at Doritos, like you look at the, the back of a bag of Doritos, even Doritos are contributing to deforestation because of the palm oil that's in there and it's not sustainably certified. Right. So, I mean, what's the solution is, OK, because we need palm. So you cut it down, just just plant it as you cut it, essentially. Well, the, the goal is just to have sustainable farms. And so I don't know exactly what the, I think it's called RSPO. There's a whole organization that goes in and certifies them. I don't know if that means they're helping to protect other land. Like if they buy a thousand acres, they only, you know, grow palm oil on half of it. I, I'm not sure of like what they're doing, but I do know that when you see an RSPO certification, it's going to say, hey, this is a certified sustainable yeah. source of palm oil. Yeah, I've seen a lot of articles on these type of topics. They talk about... Like the, the, no, the number one way you can fix a lot of these things is you don't rent these lands to corporations. You have the corporations buy it because when the corporation buys the land, they have a more a stake in the land to keep it uh, solvent so it can produce more product in the future, right? Whatever wow. that is, right? So if, you, if I buy a land to cut trees, I'm more likely to then replant all the trees so I have more trees to cut in the future. But if I'm just renting it, think about how you treat your car if you're renting it versus your car. Oh yeah, yeah. Some articles on that type of uh, topic from a, a root cause perspective because you treat things differently when you own it, when you have a stake in it. Absolutely, you hit a big pothole in the road. You're like, oh, it's a rental. So it's what? a rental, right? It's the same thing when when you just have. Hey, I have logging rights for ten years in this area. I'm just gonna wipe it clean. It's not my property. I don't have to worry about it, right? Yep. That's kind of yep. the mindset. So uh, I think we start first by <laughs> decreasing the pesticides in the environment and the glyphosate number one. And then number two, the monoculture stops. And if you don't have the conventional GMO crap and the high fructose corn syrup, that's where all the corn, the grain, and the GMOs are primarily coming from. So if you just go organic, you're going to totally support more local sustainable farming. And it's not going to be in this monoculture form that's putting tons of pesticides, tons of glyphosate, and that's affecting the runoff in our water too. And how does this connect back? Well, it's going to connect back because it's a stressor. It's it's inflammatory to the brain. And a lot of times the glyphosate and a lot of these pesticides can affect the brain into the gut. Because what they can do is if you look at Stephanie Senna's work at MIT, it's going to decrease that brush border where you produce enzymes. It's going to make the gut more permeable and more leaky. And that leaky gut's going to allow more stuff in your gut to get into your bloodstream like endotoxin, which is lipopolysaccharide from bad bacteria. It's going to allow undigested food particles to get into that bloodstream. That's going to activate the immune system. That's going to create more microglial activation in the brain, which is going to create cognitive issues, brain fog, mood-related issues. So anytime we look at the brain health, whether it's anxiety, which is what we're focusing on today, any inflammation in the gut can then drive inflammation in the brain. Inflammation in the brain manifests in these mood-related issues. Yep. When I had – oh, and by the way, Vietnam banned glyphosate. So good job, Vietnam. Uh, I had major anxiety when I had gut infections. And so my anxiety is much better, but then it was caused from another, another mechanism, right? So fixing the gut was critical for me to fix my anxiety. Now, we could – 
we probably should do a part two on this because, I mean, we could spend an hour just on omegas and probiotics and restoring gut health. But right. you know, we haven't even got into talking about like um, relora and ashwagandha and holy basil and uh, sensory deprivation tanks and massage and acupressure and acupuncture and essential oils and uh, GABA and, and pharma GABA and theanine and uh, lemon balm. And I mean, there's so much to cover with this anxiety conversation, but I'm glad that we discovered, we, we discussed all of these major critical pieces first, like restoring their, your brain health, making sure you've got good omegas, testing and fixing any cortisol issues, avoiding glyphosate. So you're not killing off your good bacteria and promoting bacterial overgrowth. Because if we just skip straight ahead to the magic pill, like your theanine and your GABA, well, then people aren't going to listen to the first part. Right. We want to make sure the, the biochemistry and the underlying physiology makes sense. If you, if you, that makes sense, we can plug and play various supplements, various diet or lifestyle strategies to helping to affect the root cause. Yeah. So we'll do a part two. Let's do a part two on anxiety later, because I think that we can do a whole hour just on how you use specific remedies. Like I've got a whole timing to my adaptogens. Like I may do, you know, ashwagandha more towards the evening to help kind of calm down and settle at night versus I may go yeah. holy basil in the morning to stimulate. So there could be a whole circadian rhythm to your supplementation as well. Exactly. And of course, movement has a huge effect. Uh, partly, I think movement's going to help because you're producing various beta endorphin, which has antidepressant qualities to it. And beta endorphin is, is a 19 um, amino acid compound. So there's 19 amino acids that make up beta endorphin. So you need protein to make it. Okay. Uh, number one. So movement's going to help with that. I think movement also helps with insulin resistance and insulin sensitivity. So it makes your cells more insulin sensitive and helps kind of soak up extra blood sugar. So if you have dysglycemia issues, it's going to help soak up that extra blood sugar that's hanging around and essentially give you a bigger sponge, aka bigger muscles, especially if you're doing more resistance training and interval training, it's going to give you bigger muscles to soak up extra blood sugar. As well, which is helpful. That's very cool. And yeah. I've noticed that my blood sugar has been on the lower end. Like I was, I actually, my wife let me uh, prick her finger to check her blood sugar, which is good. We did like a grass fed steak. We did some steamed broccoli with butter, and then we did a baked sweet potato. So we had the same exact meal. We ate it at the same exact time. And my blood sugar within 45 minutes, we'll call it one hour after mm -hmm. that, meal, my blood sugar was already back down to an 80. And, her, oh, wow. and hers was 100. So I thought, huh. Now, of course, she's pregnant, so maybe that has an effect. Oh, but I, totally. thought, man, mm -hmm. I thought, man, is my blood sugar crashing too quick? How am I already back down to an 80 one hour later? And all I had was, you know, I had a sweet potato. I thought for sure it'd be above 100 still. Yeah, and it just could be that you're really insulin sensitive. And sometimes uh -huh. if, you, if you do too much carbohydrate for you, a lot of low blood sugar issues is from too much insulin. So if you stimulate too much insulin from too much carbs, that can drop it. But 80, I don't think is that bad. It, it, I would want to see how two hours looked and yeah. how three hours looked and to see if you kind of leveled out and then how you felt too. Yeah, I, I feel kind of low at, at 80. Do you do you track at all what number you, you feel bad at? Because I mean, on the conversation of anxiety, like if I get a bout of anxiety and I feel kind of shaky or irritable or nervous, uh, I'll check my blood sugar and sometimes I'll be at maybe a 70, maybe mid 70s. I start to feel weird at that level. Yeah, it's hard, right? Because what happens is the faster your blood sugar goes down, the faster adrenaline and cortisol is there to pick it up. So if your blood sugar is like this and it's a slow arc, yeah, and we take a picture of it right here, that's different than taking a picture of it right there when you eat too much carbs and it's coming down like this. So the wow. steeper the angle is, the worse for anxiety and mood because the steeper the angle, that means you're crashing at a faster rate, which means there's more likely that you're going to have adrenaline and cortisol lift you up. So the more it's like this and it's kind of tangentially coming down, less chance of cortisol and adrenaline to pick it back up. But if it's coming like this and you grab a snapshot there, then there's more likely to be adrenaline and cortisol and you may feel that. So when people say, you know, hypoglycemia issues, you look in the Merck manual, what does Merck say? Oh, well, you know, take some sugar pills, all this crap. Well, that doesn't fix the root cause of how the hell you got there. That's, That's right. Because yeah. how you got there, we're doing that exact same strategy. So what happens is people that follow those kind of conventional medical advice for nutrition, they're on this perpetual blood sugar roller coaster 
all the time almost. Yeah, the people that like travel with the glucose tablets you're talking about. Yeah, I'll just eat some candy. Let me eat some Skittles. Okay, my blood sugar is fine now. I had Skittles. Exactly. Does not fix any of the issues. And see, I don't do that. I don't I don't do any processed sugars per se. You know, I had like some blueberries with breakfast. Uh, so I'm just so wondering. So they can understand what the heck's happening there. You already, you over, you overshoot your blood sugar from too much carbohydrates and refined sugar. So you have a really steep drop in your blood sugar. Then it comes down and then you're like, oh, I'm going to follow the conventional medicine advice. And so you come back up again and then you keep on doing these high and low peaks and you keep on having to smooth it out with extra carbs and sugar versus kind of come in there like this where you're snaking along versus falling off the cliff. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. It's a much, it's, it, it's, people don't understand. I mean, when we look at, like you said, like violent crime in prisons, or we look at car wrecks, or we look at people shooting each other, or we look at any big situation happening where someone's doing something stupid, I would put a high amount of money on the fact that it's probably someone who's on a conventional American diet with a crazy blood sugar pattern and they're hypoglycemic. You can't think straight. Trust me. My blood sugar is low. I had one period where it was like a 58 or a 60. I couldn't think straight. I mean, right. you literally can't think straight and make decisions. All you can think about is I got to do something. I got to eat something. Exactly. And I'm doing some kind of hand gestations here to kind of symbolize what's happening with the blood sugar. So if anyone's listening to this on the podcast, feel free and check below. You can access the video here too. So we're, we're live on YouTube as well as Facebook to see that. Well, let's, let's wrap it up, but I do want to go one, one further question for you. And how would you recommend approaching that? So if you're someone who like me, you're away from refined carbohydrates, except I will do some organic white rice. I will do some sweet potato. Those are my starches of choice. Um, so in that situation, is it just more adrenal support for me? Is it just staying low carb for my breakfast and lunch and only doing the carbs at dinner? Like, how would you say if I'm looking at glucose and I'm seeing that I'm going back down to like a mid seventies or an 80 and I want to hang out around maybe 90 cause I feel better there. How would you, how would you achieve that? Is it possible to do that with just like fat and proteins? Well, number one, I think you're a leaner dude. So I would first look at like what your activity levels are for the day. If you're not super active physically, then I'd be focusing on more proteins and fats for, for your fuel source. And then, you know, work on timing more of your carbs later in the day. There's some data that carb backloading, doing carbs later in the day tends to be a little bit better. Again, there are other people, this is so controversial, but I mean, there's been research on it. People in the backloading carb community kind of know that people tend to do better with carbs at nighttime. There's some data where people take their carbohydrates and they put it all at the back end of the day. And then while the control group does it throughout the day gradually, and there's been better weight loss patterns doing it like that at night. So there is that benefit. So I would do more of the carbs at night and then I would keep more protein and fat as, as kind of your foundational base. Think of protein and fat as like logs in the fire. So if you have a good fire, the logs in the fire are going to keep that fire burning sustainably. The carbohydrates are going to be like kindling or twigs and the more refined the carbohydrate or the more high, higher glycemic index it is, the more it's like, it's like gasoline or paper, right? It goes up faster. But if you have logs on that fire, that's going to keep that fire burning long and strong versus if you just do paper, twigs, and gasoline, you're up and out. So twigs and paper and gasoline is the um, too much refined sugar, not enough protein and fat. And then you have these up and down swings of blood sugar. The logs on the fire are going to be like the high quality protein and fat. And then we have to dial in the carbohydrates according to your metabolic needs. I need to check it. I, actually, I mean, I like data. You and I both do. So I need yeah. to just check, check and see can my body take, let's say I do like a grass fed beef stick, right? And it's like, let's just make something up, you know, 15 grams of fat and 15 grams of protein. In right. theory, I should be able to take that beef stick and convert that over to glucose, even though it's primarily fat and protein, correct? Yeah. I mean, you will be able to do with some of that for sure. I mean, your brain only needs about 20 grams of glucose today, so you won't get a, a ton okay. of glucose out of it, but yeah, you'll get a little bit of glucose via gluconeogenesis. And then you're also going to get more ketones, right? And people that have, they're higher in ketosis, their blood sugar may go lower, but you got to remember their blood sugar can go a little bit lower because they have more other fuel substrates in the bloodstream called ketones. So they may be able to go lower where someone's just jacking their blood sugar up and down through a reactive hypoglycemic episode, right? Reactive is 
up and then you're reacting by going down fast. It's a steeper angle of that blood sugar dropping. You're going to have less ketones there because you haven't done the right things in your diet over a period of a couple of days or weeks to get into ketosis where you have more ketones. Um, anytime you're surging insulin, you're going to be not, you're going to be kicked out of ketosis because you need lower insulin levels to be making ketones. High insulin blocks ketosis. So if we're keeping our blood sugar under control and we're kind of snaking along and not jacking our blood sugar up too high above 100, 110, 120, then we'll have more ketones and therefore your blood sugar could drop a little bit lower. But I even see some of these people that are really doing a lot of ketogenic diets, they may even go a little bit too low. I mean, I see people posting 50 and 60 for blood sugar range. That may be a little bit too low. But I mean, test it out, try it, see how you feel, see how you look, see how you perform and see if we can... Um, Connect the dots there to make it. That's cool. Easier. So I may be fine at a seventy if I have some ketones running in the background. Yes, if makes there's sense. more, if there's enough ketones in the background, I think that's the key thing. Makes sense. Well, let's do a part two on this later, but we got to wrap it up. Say, the only thing I would say is that it just depends. If your body needs more glucose because of what you're doing, um, stress wise, then you may have a cortisol surge to fill in the gap via gluconeogenesis. So. Cause that's the thing. So like if I'm at a 70, I feel like I'm getting low. You can feel that anxiety starting to creep in at a 70. It's like, well, do I go and eat something like an apple that's I know is going to raise glucose or do I go do a beef stick or do I do a beef stick and an apple to get glucose up? Yeah. I would probably do a beef stick and an apple. Do both. Yeah. I would probably okay. do both. So you can stabilize it with the fat and the protein, but then you do have some actual glucose coming in at the same time. Exactly. And again, you'll, you, there'll be fructose in there, but fructose is a 55, 45 or 50. It's close. So you, even though you get fructose in, you're going to get about still 45. But you don't want to do just the apple because if you do just the apple, then you're up and down again, depending on what type of the apple too. So that's why we always talk about like putting almond butter or something else on there, coconut or, butter. Or, yeah, or even do a Granny Smith, which has half, half the amount of sugar as well. But then yep. you get some of the fiber too. So it's less, you're not going to quite have that as much with lower glycemic fruit with full fiber. But yeah, you still, it's a good idea to always have the protein and fat along with it. For sure. I stay away from pink lady. I tested a pink lady apple. I went from like a 75 to like 130 with a pink lady apple. I mean, that thing's like just candy. It shouldn't oh, even yeah. be sold. Yeah, exactly. That's why I, my, I primarily do Granny Smith's half the sugar. And um, I'll typically do it with some cinnamon on it and some almond butter. That's delicious. Hmm. I know. Love it. Well, hey, Evan, let's wrap things up. We'll be back next week and we'll talk a little bit more. We maybe can expand upon this topic or even choose a, a new topic. So I appreciate all you guys in the background with great questions. We'll continue to expand on this conversation here in the weeks to come. Anything else, Evan, you want to leave the listeners with? Yeah, people just reach out. If you need help, work on your blood sugar, stabilize it. But, you know, this stuff can get tricky. So if you need help, don't hesitate to reach out. We can work with you around the world. Justin's website is justinhealth.com. My site's evanbrand.com. We look forward to helping you out. Thanks so much, guys. You have a phenomenal day. We'll talk soon. Take care, Evan. Bye. Bye.